Great, thanks. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Monica Schleyer-Smith is an associate professor in the physics department at Stanford University. Her current research centers on advancing optical control of interactions among laser-cooled atoms with an eye towards applications in quantum simulation and quantum metrology. She has pioneered techniques and ideas for simulating phenomena of condensed matter physics and quantum gravity using tools of atomic physics and developed protocols in quantum control for entanglement enhanced sensing. She is recipient of the Alfred P. Sloan Fel Foundation Fellowship, a National Science Foundation Career Award, and recipient of the President's Early Career Award for Science and Engineering. Please welcome Professor Monica Schleyer-Smith. Oh, Monica, you're muted. <laughs> there you go. Yep, perfect. Thanks so much um, for the invitation to be uh, here virtually at Northwestern. Um, let me make sure my screen is shared. Yep, looks good. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, you heard two wonderful talks about um, artificial atoms, and I'll be switching gears uh, to talk about uh, real atoms. The title of my talk is Engineering Quantum Spin Models with Atoms and Light. And uh, I'll be talking about work going on in my group on using light to control the interactions between laser-cooled atoms. Now, for context, I thought I would um, start by showing a few pictures um, illustrating the really extraordinary level of control that is achieved over laser-cooled atoms um, in the number of groups around the world, um, thanks to really recent advances um, in positioning individual atoms in optical tweezers. It's become possible over the past few years to have you know, highly programmable systems of, let's say, 1D arrays of atoms, 2D arrays, even 3D structures like the one shown here. Um, and particularly if you look at this middle image, this might remind you um, of um, some crystalline material, um, except that this, um, this uh, scale bar here tells you the spacing between these atoms is about five microns. So compared to what you would encounter um, in a solid state material, um, these systems are magnified by about four orders of magnitude. Um, now that length scale is roughly set by the optical wavelength that's used to um, trap and image atoms. Um, and so if you want to start doing physics with these systems, um, you need to have the ability to introduce some very long ranged interactions between the individual atoms. So what I'll be focusing on today in my talk um, is actually using light to control long range interactions between atoms. And again, by long range here, we mean at least on the few micron scale or maybe even on the millimeter scale. Um, long compared to this uh, uh, typical length scale uh, on which we can um, uh, address and, and image the atoms. Now, in some sense, I, I would say we can draw inspiration from these top pictures showing the extraordinary degree of control over the positions of the atoms and start to ask the question, um, given the fact that we have you know, such great control over light, can we start to think about really also programming the interactions between the atoms by harnessing that, that degree of optical control? So that'll be my focus today. Um, but first, I'll, I, just to give sort of a little bit of um, context of why might you want to do this. Um, uh, there are a few different spheres of application um, that we have in mind. Those range from um, designing the structure of interactions in order to make some particular uh, quantum state that um, might be a resource for enhanced sensing or computation. Um, to building up particular structures of, of interactions that might allow you to simulate um, problems from, let's say, condensed matter physics. Can we build um, frustrated magnets in the lab um, and, and simulate their properties? Um, or encoding in a quantum system that's in the lab um, some, some building up a Hamiltonian um, that maps onto some real world optimization problem. If you can map your real world problem onto minimizing the energy of some Hamiltonian that you can build in the lab, maybe the quantum system will give you some better way of solving it. Um, so I thought just for concreteness, I would um, give an example from this um, bottom um, uh, section here of, of um, what exactly do we mean by mapping real world problems onto quantum systems? Um, I always sort of heard this in a hand waving way. Um, but I was happy when I encountered like a really concrete example of this. So here's a real world problem that you might encounter um, at the beginning of the academic year, which is um, that we need to schedule classes for students. 
Um, and uh, in particular, in a simple case, we might have a situation where we have two possible time slots, a morning slot and an afternoon slot, and we want to schedule classes um, in parallel in these slots in such a way that as many students as possible can take both uh, two different classes that they want to take. So if you wanted to, um, so, so it's a complex optimization problem, and one way that you could sort of um, uh, uh, formalize this problem is to say I'm going to draw a graph and the vertices on this graph are the classes and um, I will weight the edges between these classes. Each edge will represent the number of students who want to take both of these two classes. Okay, so um, if I to schedule these classes well, what I should do is if there are many people who want to take both classes, there's a heavy edge here, I should put one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So I'll give those two vertices different colors if there's a heavy edge between them. Um, and so the optimization problem um, it has a name, it's called max cut. It's basically you want to cut the most heavily weighted edges or um, uh, looking more from a physics perspective, you'll immediately see I can think of this as some kind of an anti-ferromagnetic spin model right? Um, red and blue represent spin up and spin down. And what I want to do is to minimize the energy of, of this Ising model on some, some graph that's drawn here um, with antiferromagnetic couplings. Okay, so that so far, um, this Ising model um, uh, can be understood um, classically unless I add some term to the Hamiltonian that doesn't commute with these SZ terms. And there are lots of open questions about whether um, if you can um, program these interactions, um, you can actually use the quantum system somehow to help. But if it's going to help, then one thing you're probably going to need or definitely going to need is some term in your Hamiltonian that doesn't commute with these Ising terms, such as a transverse field. Um, so um, if you'd like to start to explore these questions, the ingredients you would need in the lab would be, well, some um, spins, um, long range interactions between them, and the ability to program the structure of those long range interactions. Okay. So I'll be talking about actually kind of two different cold atom systems that um, we play with in our lab um, that uh, give different ways of realizing long range interactions between the atoms. Um, one approach is to couple to highly excited, highly polarizable Rydberg states, and that gives rise to interactions on the scale of um, a few microns. Um, and the second approach, which is in the spirit of um, what Pruneha talked about um, in the latter part of her talk, is to have um, mediated interactions, in this case, um, long range interactions that are mediated by photons in an optical resonator. And those interactions, um, in our case, the resonator mode extends over a millimeter length scale, um, and that allows, in turn, interactions that can extend over this millimeter length scale. So highly long range and highly non-local. Okay, so um, let's start with this first system, um, long range but local. So the basic approach, um, is uh, to start with, in our lab, um, we're working with cesium atoms. The blue dot here shows um, uh, an illustration of the ground state of a cesium atom. And if I couple this atom to a Rydberg state, say of principal quantum number 43, um, this is a scale drawing showing how much bigger it gets. Um, the radius goes as, as n squared. And the van der Waals interactions between these atoms actually scale as n to the 11th power. <laughs> so. Um, uh, so this is what allows you then to get on a few micron length scale um, very strong interactions. This general approach um, is uh, explored in um, a number of groups around the world and there have been some really beautiful experiments um, harnessing these Rydberg interactions to make um, highly entangled Schrodinger cat type states um, to realize um, topological spin models. Um, and um, there are different ways of harnessing the Rydberg states um, uh, for uh, realizing interactions between the atoms. Um, some of the examples I showed here have direct interactions between the Rydberg atoms. Those atoms are, the states are somewhat short lived. The lifetime is on the sort of 100 microsecond scale. So sort of a complementary approach that one can take is to say, I'd like to work with stable atomic ground states but nevertheless introduce a bit of the long range interacting character in a way that I can control with light by coupling one of those ground states off resonantly to a Rydberg state. This approach is called Rydberg dressing, and this is an approach um, that uh, we've been uh, working on in my lab. So um, in the experiments that we've been doing so far, um, I uh, won't be showing you pictures of one of these nice ordered arrays. So far they're done in sort of the messier setting um, of uh, a, a cloud of atoms in an optical dipole trap. Um, and essentially what we're doing is illuminating some region of this cloud of atoms with light that um, 
couples the atoms uh, to a Rydberg state to turn on interactions. And so um, what I've shown here is um, we're encoding a spin in two hyperfine ground states within each atom. Um, but to turn on interactions, um, we shine a laser that off-resonantly couples one of those states to a Rydberg state. And now if I have two atoms and they're very far apart, the effect of that laser is actually just to cause an AC Stark shift. It shifts the atomic level of it. But if the atoms come very close together, that AC Stark shift is actually suppressed, essentially by the impossibility of simultaneously exciting both of those atoms. So there's some energy shift that depends on whether the atoms are far apart or close together. That's an interaction. Um, and in particular, that ends up looking like effectively an Ising interaction between the ground state spins. Um, and OK, so one way that I can tell that that interaction is there is if I have an Ising interaction, what I expect is that um, if I consider a given spin, and maybe I start with it um, having some polarization in, let's say, the x direction, it will process about the z components of surrounding spins. Um, in our case, the interaction range is a few microns, and there are some tens of atoms within that interaction range. And so we can start to probe these interactions by essentially kind of the mean field dynamics of asking if I start with a spin polarized state and I vary the tilt of that spin polarized state on the block sphere, vertical here is the z direction, um, depending on the tilt, the precession rate should be either faster or slower depending on because the tilt determines whether more surrounding spins are up or down. Um, so that's something um, that we can see. So this is actually the red points are different kind of initial um, uh, magnetizations of our atomic system, and I turn on the light and um, watch how those points evolve, and we see this kind of a twist, this SZ-dependent um, precession rate that's, that's coming from the magnetization of each atom's neighboring spins. Okay, so that's a signature that the Ising interactions are present. Um, and I mentioned earlier that actually um, this is a spatially extended system that we're illuminating with light. So we can also ask about spatial information. On the left, I showed you sort of locally what's going on in the center of the cloud. Um, but if you look either, um, if you look at different positions in the cloud, you can see that the amount of this twisting that tells us the strength of the Ising interaction um, varies spatially. So here I'm showing that by letting um, the vertical axis indicate the tilt of the magnetization. Um, the color indicates the phase, right? And so if there's a twist, that means the top will turn blue and the bottom will turn red. And that effect is strongest here where the light intensity is strongest and then falls off in a way that we can understand from the spatial profile of the light beam. So this is neat because it actually directly shows this optical control of the interactions. Um, just as a side note, I'll mention one reason why this sort of twisting effect is interesting. Um, so far, we've looked at the, the mean field dynamics, but um, if you started to ask what's happening to the quantum fluctuations of the magnetization, these dynamics should be expected to squeeze the quantum fluctuations. Um, and that's an effect that we hope to detect in the system um, soon. Um, one tool that's useful actually both for this application in, um, in engineering squeeze states, but also, as I mentioned before, um, if you want to um, study, for example, these quantum optimization problems, is you'd like to have not just the interactions, but also a transverse field. Um, so we thought we would actually um, explore whether we can also um, realize um, a transverse field Ising model in this system. And it turns out that that is something that most naturally, in, in our case, is done by essentially rapidly alternating between turning on the Rydberg dressing light that generates these Ising interactions and turning on in, uh, a microwave coupling that we can think of as an effective transverse field because it couples the spin up and down, spin down states. Um, so we rapidly alternate between these, these two different Hamiltonians in such a way that we have some effective Hamiltonian that um, is, is a transverse field Ising model. And um, again, we'll check that we've correctly implemented this Hamiltonian by looking at the, the mean field dynamics of the system. So um, in particular, so I'm writing sort of a, a mean field model here in terms of the average magnetization in some region of the cloud. Um, and OK, in a simple case, if I have, uh, let's say, only the transverse field and no interactions, um, and I start with these squares are sort of different initial states of my magnetization, then the transverse field should, should just make the um, spin process about the x-axis, and, and that's what happens. Um, but one way I'll just point out of thinking about um, sort of what these dynamics mean is um, there's, in this case, one particular fixed point, which is just along the x-axis. And that is essentially um, 
the paramagnetic ground state of this Hamiltonian that's just a field along x. If we start to turn on the interactions, um, we can see how these dynamics change. And in particular, what we start to see happening is that rather than seeing just precession about this one fixed point, we see these two new fixed points that are essentially the ferromagnetic ground states of the Hamiltonian um, with the Ising interactions. So we're seeing signatures in the dynamics of this phase transition from paramagnetic to ferromagnetic. Um, and one kind of neat feature here is that actually these different um, trajectories I showed you on these block spheres are actually just looking at different regions of my spatially extended atomic cloud. Um, and in particular, um, uh, if I again give you kind of one of these color plots where um, the vertical axis is the tilt of my block vector and the color is the phase, then the fixed points um, we initialized at, f at, at, at a phase of zero. The fixed points are the ones where the phase has this white color, the phase is still zero. And you can see actually as a function of position in the clouds, this splitting from a single fixed point that represents the paramagnetic ground state to these two new fixed points that represent the ferromagnetic ground states. Um, and I think this nicely sort of illustrates again this optical control of the interactions that just by introducing a spatially inhomogeneous um, uh, uh, laser field, we can uh, realize a system that over here is in the ferromagnetic, but over here is in the paramagnetic phase. Um, so uh, the direction we are um, now taking this is, uh, is towards um, uh, implementing these same types of interactions in a system where we'll have um, higher de a higher degree of control over also the positions of the atoms, like the pictures I showed at the beginning of the talk. Um, and once you start to do that, um, as soon as you switch the sign of the interaction, which we can easily do just by choice of laser parameters to anti-ferromagnetic, this is a highly frustrated system. Um, it's precisely that kind of max cut type of a problem I showed early on. Um, and in fact, this sequence of alternating between interactions and the transverse field um, is precisely an, an algorithm that's um, of interest for um, trying to find the ground states that solve this optimization problem. Um, so we're interested in exploring um, that and related problems. There's another one that sort of naturally maps onto central spin type models that we can also realize in the system. And there'll be um, a theory paper on this second idea that we'll be putting on the archive this week. Um, so that kind of gives a flavor of what we're doing in one physical system where we have interactions that are um, long range but still local in the sense that they decay on the um, few micron scale. Um, if you want to start having an even higher degree of control over the graph of interactions, um, and perhaps to be able to encode a wider, um, a, a more generic set of problems in this sphere of optimization, for example, um, it, it would be great to be able to have a system where I'm not actually constrained to have interactions decay with distance. And in fact, um, we, we have that in, in a second experiment where we trap atoms in an optical resonator and we allow photons to basically carry information between the atoms. So the basic concept um, is um, that, for example, if I want to turn on a spin exchange interaction between two atoms, so I want to make these two atoms flip-flop, um, what I can do is I will um, arrange a situation where I drive essentially a Raman process that allows an atom to flip its spin and put a photon into the cavity. So there's a drive field, um, and this, this other arrow here represents the cavity mode. So I can turn on a process controllably where an atom can flip its spin and put a photon in the cavity. That photon can be absorbed by another atom that flips its spin. And so the cavity can mediate flip-flop processes that are basically as long-ranged as the cavity mode is, is spatially delocalized. Um, that's kind of the, the scheme. If you look at um, it in reality, it looks something like this. So here's our optical cavity, two mirrors. They're about five centimeters apart. Um, we trap um, atoms uh, in a standing wave um, that's um, in the cavity mode. So the atoms are spatially pinned, and the dynamics will just be in the spin degree of freedom. Um, and to start with, I'll show you pictures where it's, again, um, just a, an extended cloud of atoms. Locally, they're trapped in the standing wave, and the cloud is kind of order millimeter scale long. Um, so for example, um, here's an experiment where, so we're taking pictures from below. Here's an experiment where we initiated the system by putting some spin excitation. So the cloud extends over this full range, but we put some spin excitations in region A here. Um, and at time t equals zero, we turned on the drive field. Um, and 
and just watched where the spin excitations go. So I'm just basically um, summing over the transverse direction of the cloud, and each row is just showing me um, the spin polarization as a function of position um, in the long direction. And so we can see in this particular case, we saw the spin excitations kind of hop over from this region here called A to this region called B and back. Um, there are some oscillations, which showed us that um, there's uh, coherence in the system, which is, is good. Um, and so far, we can actually understand this pattern of where the spin excitations hop quite well by essentially saying that the spin exchange coupling between any two atoms is just given by the product of their couplings to the cavity mode. Um, so that's um, a start. We're starting to turn on these very long-ranged interactions. Um, but I said earlier that we wanted to take advantage of the fact that we can control the interactions with light to show some degree of programmability. Um, so the dream is that at some point we'll have something like a function generator in the lab where just by um, um, pressing buttons you can decide is the interaction, let's say, ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic. Do I have flip-flop couplings like I just showed you or maybe Ising interactions um, that we also talked about earlier? Um, and can I start to also control the spatial structure of these long-range interactions? If you want a 1D chain, you could do it in the cavity, but maybe you'd rather use something like the Rydberg system. Um, but in the cavity, you could have very exotic interactions where every atom talks to every other. These types of all-to-all -all couplings are of interest um, in this category of um, optimization problems. Or maybe even crazier interaction structures like this tree um, that um, uh, we um, have been thinking about theoretically as perhaps a toy model for some of the quantum aspects of black, of, uh, uh, of black holes. So. Um, uh, how, how flexible can we become in terms of controlling the couplings between these, these spins? Um, okay, so I'll start by showing you an example where the spatial structure is simply still dictated by the couplings of products um, of the atom light couplings. So the pairwise coupling between two spins has some form that's the product of local couplings to the cavity mode. But we're going to start to ask, can we control the form of the couplings um, and, and the sign of the couplings? Um, so. I'll write down the Hamiltonian because we have this product structure of the interactions. I can actually write down the Hamiltonian in terms of some collective spin that's a weighted sum of the spins of the individual atoms. Um, and one of the neat things we can do in this system is actually we can flexibly tune the relative strength of this XY coupling and the Ising coupling. Um, simply, it turns out by controlling the orientation of a magnetic field relative to the cavity axis. Um, and we can control the sign of the interaction simply by um, controlling the sign of a laser detuning relative to cavity resonance. Um, so those two ingredients actually give us, um, here's a plot on the right, where we've mapped out um, both the Ising coupling and the spin exchange coupling as a function of um, angle of a magnetic field. Um, and we can fully tune um, from the limit of pure Ising to pure spin exchange and anywhere in between. OK, and we can also access either sign. Um, the way, just to give you a flavor, the way that we actually measure this and see that it works um, is essentially by looking at spin dynamics. So we initialize some spin texture in the cloud of atoms, um, some spins that are pointing along z, along x, along minus x. We turn on the light and we watch how this spin texture evolves. Um, and we design this in such a way that that allows for sort of transparently extracting the spin, spin couplings from the dynamics. Um, but sort of if you're kind of coming more from, um, you know, a um, materials science background, you're probably, you might be more used to thinking about um, uh, what are kind of the low energy states of a given Hamiltonian, right? Um, what is the phase diagram? Um, and so we thought, okay, let's sort of cross check that we have this control by also looking at um, more adiabatically preparing low energy states um, for a given um, form of this Hamiltonian. So, a way that we can do that is we start with a spin polarized state aligned with some effective magnetic field. Um, and then we slowly turn on the interactions um, and see how, that, um, uh, how the spins respond. So um, let me first show a simple example where actually there are no interactions just to orient you. Um, so here what I've done is I've basically ramped on a particular orientation of a magnetic field or an, it's actually an effective magnetic field um, and the vertical axis is basically the Z component over the X. It's basically the tilt of this field. Um, the color represents the magnetization. So if the field is more up, the spins are more up. And if it's more down, the spins are more down. So they follow. But now if you turn on interaction, so for example, if I turn on um, a ferromagnetic Ising interaction, what you see is that this smooth rotation of the spins versus the field orientation turns into a very, very sharp step. Um, and conversely, if I turn on the anti-ferromagnetic interaction, the, the step is washed out. 
Um, so I can kind of summarize this by plotting a magnetic susceptibility for this system. Um, and as we approach a critical strength of the Ising interactions, that susceptibility um, appears to diverge at least to within our experimental resolution. Um, and that matches what we would expect as we approach, um, again, a phase transition from the paramagnetic to a ferromagnetic state. One kind of um, funny thing is that, that um, if you actually do the same experiment but with spin exchange interactions, you get almost the same behavior of the magnetic susceptibility, but it's the mirror image. So the anti-ferromagnetic spin uh, exchange interactions act the same way as the ferromagnetic Ising interactions. That might seem a little bit surprising, um, but it actually can be understood um, by noting that sort of in some limit where I think of the atoms as forming a large collective spin, um, it turns out that um, these XY interactions of one sign are almost equivalent to Ising interactions of the opposite sign, except for some term that involves the, the total spin, which is initially um, in its maximum state. Um, so that's kind of um, cute, but also a little bit disappointing because you would like to, if you're going to sort of maybe study some richer many body physics in the system that's not just the physics of a single large spin, you'd like to actually be in a regime where there's a difference between these Ising and these XY cases. Um, so here's an example where there's a difference. Um, here's an experiment where we um, initialize uh, um, a spin polarized state and turn on actually an inhomogeneous field. Um, so there's a magnetic field gradient across the system in the absence of interactions that reveals itself if we look at the phase um, by a phase winding across the cloud that's shown by this sort of rainbow texture appearing. Um, if we do the same thing in the presence of spin exchange interactions, um, the picture is dramatically different. Um, and in particular, uh, what you'll see is that all of a sudden it looks, it looks kind of boring and it looks boring because this spin spiral is no longer appearing. And in particular, the spin exchange interactions are actually protecting the system from dephasing. So this is something, so we can summarize that by looking at the phase winding across the cloud. Um, Ising interactions, not surprisingly, don't do anything um, to combat the effect of an inhomogeneous Z field, um, but these XY interactions completely suppress this phase winding. Um, so this is a, a neat example where, first of all, yes, there's a difference, um, and it's actually kind of a useful um, effect where um, just by turning on these interactions, um, one can protect against spatial inhomogeneities that, in particular, could be relevant if you're trying to use the light, you need the light to make, let's say, some entangled state, um, and you want to avoid um, causing dephasing when, when turning on the interactions. We can actually understand this effect by saying, again, these two types of interaction are almost the same, but in the Ising case, in the spin exchange case, there's an extra energy gap between manifolds of different total spin. And so that means if you start in the spin polarized state, there's a, a, a cost to reducing the spin polarization um, that suppresses dephasing. Um, so that was uh, um, proposed and examined um, spectroscopically also in some work in, uh, by Anna Maria Ray and James Thompson at Jilla. Um, here uh, we have the nice ability to really directly see this effect on the spin dynamics. Um, so, so far, I, I think I'm, I'm running out of time, but I, have, um, I hope I can say a couple more things. Um, um, because so far everything I've shown you is, is something you can understand actually in, in kind of a fairly classical picture. Um, and I want to convince you that there's also something more quantum going on. So um, in the last um, couple of minutes, I'll show you some experiments where we're actually taking advantage of the fact that our atoms, I've swept this under the rug so far, but we actually have in our lab a spin one system, um, which allows us to very naturally do some experiments that we can't simply understand in terms of um, uh, sort of the dynamics of some local magnetization. Um, so, so for example, suppose I initialize all of the atoms in the zero state of this spin one system, and I turn on these spin exchange interactions. In principle, this Hamiltonian tells me I should be allowed to have a process where I take two m equals zero atoms, and I create a pair of plus one and minus one. Um, so that actually, that happens in our experiment. So here's a um, uh, hundred repetitions of the same experiment where we measure the populations in these three different states. And you'll see that um, we start with them in the zero state. And once, once we measure, we'll find sometimes they're still in the zero state, but um, oftentimes we see population in the plus and minus one states and it's always correlated. So this is actually a photon mediated interaction that 
gives rise to correlated atom pairs in a way that has been studied in the past by collisional interactions in Bose-Einstein condensates um, and actually used to prepare entangled states of interest for quantum metrology. Um, but the neat thing in our system is that this interaction, it's not a local collisional interaction. It's an interaction that we can turn on at millimeter scale distances. Um, and it actually happens very fast in the sort of um, uh, hundreds of microseconds time scale. So it raises the question, given that this interaction can be very long range and is controlled by light, can we start to even control the spatial structure of the interactions and the correlations um, to, to uh, control which, which quantum states we access? And so um, to sort of be able to explore that more uh, in, in, in better detail, what we've done is um, set up a system where we have actually now an array of um, small ensembles. There's about 1,000 atoms per site. Um, they form this, this lattice um, of about 20 sites. And um, we're starting to ask the question, how well can we control the structure of the interactions between site I and site J? And the vision is to have a system where you can basically program in, let's start modestly and say, I'd like to at least be able to realize any kind of translation invariant coupling graph, control the structure of the interactions versus distance. Um, uh, and it could be very long range, it need not decay monotonically with distance. Um, so how might we be able to do that? So the basic trick, um, well, we start by turning off the all to all interaction that we naturally get from the cavity by applying a magnetic field gradient across the system. Um, we can see that that works by looking at this pair creation physics and seeing that when we um, uh, turn on interactions in the presence of the gradient, the process of creating one of these plus one minus one pairs is only resonant locally if the pairs are sort of uh, 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 local. Um, and so if I look at correlations between the plus one and the minus one population, there are strong correlations on the diagonal here and then they um, decay with distance. Um, we can also play um, one extra trick which is to say, let's add a second frequency to my control field. Now there's a way that I can resonantly create these pairs at a particular distance that's set by the frequency spacing here um, and uh, the strength of the magnetic field gradient. And in fact, we then start to see correlations appearing in these pair creation dynamics at a finite distance. And lastly, we can change the frequency spectrum. It's easy to change the frequency spectrum of a laser. Um, in this case, if we change the spacing between these two control fields, we start to, and we look at what distance do the correlations appear. This is theory. Um, this is kind of the first experiment. Um, and they're already starting to take even cleaner data on this. But you can see the position where the correlations appear tracking that frequency spacing. So this is a really neat method that allows you, in principle, once you start to program the um, spectrum of the laser field, to really program arbitrary couplings um, between the spins. So I um, hope I've shown you that in these systems with um, atoms inter with optically controlled interactions, we have really a high degree of control um, over the, the form of the interaction graph, the um, sign of couplings and so forth. We've started to explore um, phase transitions and um, uh, pair creation physics and um, protecting spin coherence in the system. And we're interested in um, applications in um, resources for quantum sensing, um, studying optimization problems and also building sort of models um, inspired by condensed matter physics, such as frustrated magnets or spin glass models and probing them in the lab. So with that, um, I will um, thank my team. And um, if I haven't used too much time to <laughs> take any questions. Great, thank you, Monica. I think we'll take the time to answer one or two questions. So uh, we'll start with, uh, again, those with control of their audio and video, if anyone has a question. Otherwise, I'll uh, move to the Q&A box and ask. OK, so I don't see anyone. I was going to ask one real quick first. So all the Hamiltonians you presented show symmetric exchange interactions. I was curious to what extent, as you try to approach studying solid state systems uh, like quantum spin liquids, liquids, you can include anti-symmetric exchange interactions. Uh, in these Hamiltonians and capture those or mod modulate those energy scales? Um, I have to admit that I'm not quite familiar with your terminology. So, so this would be like a zhailozhinsky moria interaction? OK, yeah. So, so one thing is that for sh certainly in the cavity system, um, one can control the phases um, of the couplings, which I think starts to go in the direction that let me think about that. Does that does controlling the phases of the couplings help? 
Uh, I, I don't think so. No, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> yeah. There are proposals for, for studying these, um, the, I, I can't pronounce that term, but what is it? Yeah. I know. Yeah. The DM yeah. interaction, yeah. I think is the, yeah, there are actually proposals for studying those in cavity QED systems. And, um, I actually don't remember the precise scheme that it actually, no, I can. Yeah. So maybe I should put it this way. One can separately control um, the XX and the YY interaction, basically by schemes involving, maybe another way to say it is you can make the flip-flop interactions and you can also in principle make the flip-flip interactions. Um, it requires, um, yeah, some extra laser frequencies. Okay. And then you also have some control of relative phases. And once you put all those things together, you have a lot, yeah, there's a lot you can do in principle, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then we'll ask uh, the next question, which was uh, from the audience. Perhaps you've heard of the coherent IC machine, basically a system that encodes spins using stable states of degenerate optical parametric oscillators above threshold. Uh, there's a group at Stanford, the Mabuchi Lab, which is currently doing research into this. And then the question is, have you ever collaborated with them to compare this Floquet engineering technique? So, um... There's yeah, so I'm I'm aware of certainly of the work that's going on in the Mabuchi and other um, groups at Stanford Yamamoto group um, did a lot of pioneering work on this on um, yeah studying basically networks of OPOs um, as systems for quantum optimization. Um, we haven't collaborated with them, but um, um, I would love to start talking to them. Um, and um, but I think um, sorry, can you repeat the second part of the question? And then the, the second part was to compare, uh, I guess, some of these approaches with the Floquet engineering techniques. Yeah, so I think, okay, so one question is basically how do you program the graph of couplings? And then there's also a second question, which is basically how do you, you know, solve the optimization problem? Um, so uh, in terms of kind of, you know, programming the graph of couplings, um, obviously in the, in the one case you're connecting OPOs um, with, um, you know, optical, um, delay lines and things like this that control the form of the coupling. Um, and here it's a different approach. Um, but then the second question is kind of how are you using gain as your way of solving the problem? Are you trying to find something where you're basically um, sort of the system lases on some mode and that tells you the solution of your problem? Or are you trying to um, adiabatically prepare a ground state or kind of do something where you're harnessing, let's say, maybe a shortcut to adiabaticity, one of these dynamical sequences, but nevertheless, you're just trying to use coherent quantum dynamics to um, access the ground state. So um, I think, so there's definitely a very different flavor to this gain-based optimization compared to the approach that's um, trying to harness coherent quantum dynamics. And, um, you know, I think both of them are sort of important approaches to explore. And we really, I would say at this point, have so little understanding of to what extent quantum systems can offer an advantage and um, to the extent that there's evidence that these coherent Ising machines are offering an advantage to what extent, um, let's say, you know, is entanglement playing any role? It's an open quantum system. Um, so I think there are so many interesting questions that all of these approaches should be explored. Um, one thing that I've started to wonder about is in this pair creation physics I showed at the end, there, there's an amplification process going on there. So that population of pairs grows exponentially. So is there some way to connect this with these ideas of gain-based optimization? That's something we've kind of, um, uh, that has occurred to us recently and um, uh, it's a great idea that we should talk to some of our colleagues who are the experts in that, so yeah. Okay, great, thanks, thanks Monica. So I'd like to thank again, all of the speakers uh, who presented uh, today. And what we're gonna do now is shift to our panel discussion. And so I'd like to invite all of the speakers back uh, to unmute their microphones and turn back on their video. And Professor Dana Friedman will then give us the boundary conditions on the panel discussion, which will happen for the next maybe 35, 40 minutes. Okay, uh, thanks James. So as we planned this webinar, we asked uh, Northwestern graduate students and student groups to submit questions to the panel. We'll start our discussion with a few of the pre-submitted questions. Afterwards, we'll open up the discussion to everyone. At that time, the audience may type their questions in the Q&A, but actually just start typing your questions in the Q&A right now. Um, and those with video audio access may activate your video should you like to pose a question to the panel. Um, so that maybe, Monica, if you could stop screen sharing, that would be great. 